utilizing to listen into your environment. Um, so what happens in that respect is you've got basically a couple of different schools of thoughts. There's there's ransomware, which is the cybersecurity threats involving money, where there's actual a ransom or some sort of exchange of, of monetary value that's happening, or you have data theft and data manipulation. And then the last one, which is very common, especially um, around uh, like large scale events, is distributed denial of service attacks. Um, you may recall uh, recently a couple of instances where Twitter crashed because so many different people were trying to go onto that website at one time to listen to, I think they had a couple of different interview sets for some um, some high profile interviews that they were doing and it caused the entire system to crash. Well, in that instance, what's happening is, is that too many people are trying to get into that website at one time. Well, bad actors can do the exact same thing to a website or to an app, mobile app or, you know, some other streaming service where they're trying to log in as multiple different users at one time in order to overload the system and crash it. Very hard to determine whether a denial of service was intentional, malicious, or unintentional, non-malicious. And so what we're going to talk about real quick in the vulnerability side is you have both internal and external vulnerabilities. Um, internal, think of it as your, you know, your employees in the office, whether, you know, you, that could qualify as just employee didn't know they weren't supposed to do something and they unknowingly did it. Uh, it wasn't malicious. It wasn't intentional uh, to it could be a disgruntled employee where an employee is upset with management or is, you know, for whatever reason, and they're just trying to cause harm to the organization. Uh, the second would be external threats, which I think get, th these are the ones that get the most um, uh, media play because a lot of people assume that these hackers are, you know, sitting in, you know, a CD basement or something where they're hiding out and, you know, committing these crimes. What, what's really funny is, is that most of these hackers, um, are, and this is is actually kind of shocking, is, is that they actually operate like businesses, uh, especially in Russia. In St. Petersburg, um, there's a couple of places in Moscow where we actually know that these are these these shell corporations are state-funded uh, cyber uh, terrorists that are, you know, located in these offices, and they clock in, clock out with their key cards and you know, they've got, you know, coffee deliveries. There's a Starbucks right next to it. And it's actually kind of funny because the, they know exactly where these people are. They just can't do anything about it. Um, and then you have the uh, the thrill seekers, the ones that do it just for fun. Uh, nation state actors, that's more of your, you know, that's country to country. These are ones that are looking to disrupt operations. Uh, and then you have students where they're actually teaching classes now, apparently on the dark web and other places where they're actually teaching people how to be hackers and how to create ransomware profiles and do these kind of CD under uh, world activities. Uh, to talk a little bit about the attack methods and what are more commonly seen, um, I would say that the majority of attacks now come either via email through some sort of spoofing or, you know, a uh, clever uh, embedded uh, link into an email set. One of the more popular ones that was going around uh, was a uh, Apple gift card uh, where you basically you could click on this link to take a survey for a free, I think it was a $50 Apple gift card. And people were clicking on the link, then they would go in there, they'd be asked what their I, iCloud account username and password is, and then their iCloud account got was hit. Um, so what you're going to see a lot of times, especially via these attack methods, is somebody's pre either pretending to be somebody that they're not to fool them, or they're take they're redirecting them to an external website, whether that's through Facebook that then redirects them somewhere else, or they're on some sort of social media site. Um, very few and far between do you see a lot of concentrated hacks where people are actually trying to infiltrate, trying to get in, trying to bypass a firewall, trying to guess a password. 
Um, a lot of times these are more passive uh, where they're just, these hackers are just throwing whatever out, whatever sticks to the wall sticks. So they're not really trying to concentrate on one organization. They're just trying to blanket to see, you know, how many people would bite on it. Then you have your web portal, SQL injections, web defacement. This is more where related around like um, what was happening for a little while is they were hacktivists were going after certain organizations and then trying to redirect uh, or change the face of the website. This has actually been done by a, a couple of um, nation state actors who were actually known to do this inside the United States. This actually happened not too long ago to the city of Atlanta and also uh, to a couple of cities here in the southeast where they were hit. Um, man in the middle attacks, more or less a man in the middle is somebody is, best way to describe it is you go to a Starbucks and you hop on the Starbucks free Wi-Fi. And while you're on that Wi-Fi, you decide you're going to go access your mobile banking uh, account through your credit union. And because you're doing that, somebody who's sitting there on the other side of that network is actually monitoring that traffic. And they're seeing you input your username and password to go to this site because you're utilizing their internet. And so they're able to see and then copy everything that you do and mirror it. And then they have all your credentials and your information. Now, any one of these topics you could go into almost a one hour course on and go more in depth on it. So I'll try to move through this fairly quickly, but also give enough time uh, here in a couple of minutes for some questions. Um, but with all those threats out there and all of these, you know, okay, well, you know, we know what the threats are. We know how they get in. How do we stop it? How do we, you know, how do we concentrate on, uh, you know, reducing risk or mitigating threat or eliminating threat? And really it all involves, first, you need to know what your vulnerabilities are. And once you establish what your vulnerabilities are, you kind of establish what you call your zero tolerance baseline. Um, once you establish your baseline, then you start saying, okay, well, these are the things inside our organization that we have to have access to or that our employees have to be able to do to be able to do their job functions. And so then you have to start looking at mitigating your risk. Okay, well, if they have to do those job functions, then how can we protect that job function so that they're at, if there was an, an incident, it's as minimal as possible without disrupting a lot of our operations. And when we talk about prevention intrusion, detection intrusion, and then maintain re operational readiness or situational readiness, this is more kind of what your policies are driven because I, I'm a policy person. Like I, 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 I'm very much in you practice what you preach and that your policies should dictate exactly how you operate and do business. Uh, typically organizations that have really strong policies in place and they stick to those policies and they update those policies regularly are less likely to have incidents because they're hyper-focused on ensuring compliance to policy. Um, and then what this means to you, um, the biggest one of these, and I'm, I'm actually kind of skipping through the list here, it's not in order of importance, but employee training. Biggest thing that you can do inside of an organization, and it's actually the, the, less, the least costly thing that you can do, is train your employees, educate your employees on what they can do, what they can't do, what they should do if they suspect an email is not right. Ask, raise a hand. There are no, you know, nobody's going to get in trouble for, you know, asking, hey, is this legitimate? You'll get in trouble for doing something that you're not supposed to and it not being legitimate. Uh, so err on the side of caution. Always assume, a, have a trust but verify um, policy in place when it comes to anything of certain job functions, whether that's uh, an employee that's handling ACH transactions or, you know, anything where there could be on the commercial lending side, could be on the commercial banking side where they're having to deal with, you know, large ACH transfers and transactions. Of course, you know, a lot of, a lot of times you already have some of these policies in place because of the NCUA requirements. 
but then you'll have some times where, you know, you may have um, uh, requests for uh, permission accounts for a company credit card come through. And, you know, sometimes those companies can have 30 to 40 employees that, you know, because of the way and design of those companies, they they have a high rotation. So they're they're going through uh, different user accounts being created for different credit cards at any given time. So one of the things that we saw was as a company that got, you know, basically spoofed, uh, was asked to create some accounts and then asked for uh, some ACH information and then asked for an ACH wire transfer on top of what they were requesting for their company cards. Turns out it was a bad actor that was impersonating this business the entire time. Uh, and they were just, because of the person didn't, didn't think of anything, they just you were like, oh, well, they're, they ask for these things all the time. Well, they knew they were asking for those things all the time because this bad actor had been watching, almost kind of casing that business for a long time and figured out how they were conducting their business, who, they're, who they were banking with. They knew, they knew more about that business than uh, some of the employees did. Um, offsite secure backups, uh, when it comes to ransomware or just disaster recovery, um, it doesn't have to be a cybersecurity attack. It could be a lightning strike or a fire or a sprinkler head went off and, you know, flooded the server room. Numerous things could happen. And it's always best practice to have a secure offsite backup, whether that is you're utilizing a cloud service or some co-location service. As long as that backup is encrypted and that you have means to it and have uh, the ability to recover and restore quickly, that could be the difference in whether you pay the ransom or you recover in less than 72 hours. Um, software security patches, this is super important. Um, a lot of times companies, I mean, in, you know, I even say this as Inspire Technologies, we're guilty of this sometimes where we don't let certain patches run because the we might be using an application that causes that patch to crash. And sometimes you'll see in the, especially in the finance world where you have your certain, you know, financial systems where Microsoft does an update, but your core processor hasn't updated to that latest version of that OS software that Microsoft's updated and patched to. So you may be a couple of months behind and then all of a sudden there's a zero day incident that happens and you have to immediately patch an update, but then it crashes your core processor and you're like, what the world just happened? It's, oh, it's because the processor or that, app, that business application wasn't patched to the latest or wasn't updated to the latest patch from Microsoft. Um, malware and antivirus solutions, these have really become kind of in two different ballparks. You have both a, there's your home personal uh, antivirus, and then there's your commercial enterprise antivirus. And most people have gone away from the traditional antivirus and moved more towards endpoint detection and response tool sets with inside. It's a kind of think of it as antivirus 2.0, where it's more, involved in monitoring all of the aspects of the computer system and the environment as a whole. And it can automate some of the functions where it can immediately shut down certain processors or certain processes on your device, shut down your device, and it can even remove your device from the network if it deemed there was an active threat. And there's numerous different flavors of ice cream for endpoint detection, response and antivirus tool sets, one of the ones that's more, I would say, has gotten a lot more famous in the last few weeks, CrowdStrike, because of the incident that happened that basically shut down the entire, call it what it is, it shut down our entire flight system because a lot of the systems that were being used by the FAA uh, were being utilized by CrowdStrike because CrowdStrike does a lot of work with inside the government space. So it made sense that a lot of the FAA systems had CrowdStrike in place because they were the preferred vendor for the federal government. And in doing so, they were asking, like, why did why did one vendor crash everything? Well, it's because that that vendor system pushed a patch update that none of the other systems were ready to accept. And there were some even some flaws with inside their patch and it just automatically the 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 software 
recognized its own software as being malicious and then shut itself down. So it wouldn't allow itself to uh, continue processing and running. So what a lot of people then quickly realize, they're like, okay, well, well, dang. So that means that not only can I, I can't rely on all of these patches and backups. I have to test these things before I put them in my production environment. I can't just trust the vendor to do this for me. And that's going to lead to another point. And it's not on this slide here, but um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, log scanning and log review, uh, where you're actually going back and looking at the records that are taking place inside the organization, uh, where you're actually looking at the data structure, who's downloading what, where are they downloading it to, who's creating what files, who's deleting what files, all of these things that may not be malicious, but you'd want to know as an organization, if somebody's accessing or downloading large amounts of client files, you would want to know that. Um, that's something that maybe you don't, you wouldn't track from the outside of the organization, but inside the organization, you would want to keep an eye on that as well as outside the organization. You won't, you don't want your files being downloaded by external sources or internal resources. If you don't have a good business, uh, reason for doing it. Um, so what this means to you as far as the, you know, your network architecture, segmenting your networks, making sure that you have firewalls in place, endpoint or managed detection response tool sets, where that's your antivirus and your advanced ant antivirus tools, intrusion prevention systems and intrusion detection systems are exactly what they sound like. Uh, intrusion prevention is intended to prevent something from happening and then shuts down a business process. Intrusion detection alerts you on something that's happening and as it's involving a business process, which the three of those uh, tools can actually be kind of married in to each other. Uh, they, they work hand in hand uh, where they're detecting, preventing, and then managing. Uh, so you can think of that as being like a trifecta of tool sets that's working together in consort inside your environment. And um, real quick on this slide, this is the one that I want to talk to you because we get a lot of people asking about what do you see the latest and biggest threat to environments? And I would tell you that outside of your employees, the second biggest threat is your third party vendors. Uh, and it's the vendors who have access to your systems, vendors who you don't have control over as an organization, um, but you do. Um, one of the things that CUVM uh, does very well as far as their vendor management is they're looking at the due diligence causes of who are these companies? Where are you located? What, what, what's your states of incorporation? Who are you owned by? Um, you know, you would want to make sure that, you know, you're doing business with reputable companies, but at the same time, you don't want your data necessarily going outside the United States or into foreign countries or being accessed by, you know, entities that you don't have any control over, or you don't have, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no legal recourse to be taken against an organization that's based outside of the United States. So in following that mindset and going back to this zero trust policy, also go back and look at all of your vendors and go, what control measures do you have in place to prevent these things from happening? What does your cybersecurity insurance policy cover? Um, what is, do you have a cybersecurity insurance policy? Uh, these are all questions that really need to be asked as an organization when you're doing due diligence, uh, especially on the third party vendors that have access and the ability to um, integrate into your system. Uh, and in talking real quick, uh, I'm going to stop on this one. Does anybody have any questions so far about what we've asked? Um, I'm not monitoring the chat. So Kelly, if you Yep, I'm monitoring the chat. Again, just throw something in the chat or raise your hand or feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to uh, ask a question at this time. Give it just a second here. There's a lot of great information here, folks. Um, please feel free to ask any questions. Um, doesn't look like at this time, Zach. Okay. 
wow, I did such a great job. Nobody yeah. had any questions. <laughs> That never happens. Okay, so uh, real quick on these helpful links, this is actually the NCUA Cyber Re Security Resources, which is fantastic. Everything that you'll find on the NCUA um, comes from their, a lot of their compliance tool sets come from the Center for Internet Securities Controls, which are then derived from the uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology, which is called NIST, is the NIST framework. Um, so this is where I'm going to spend a little bit more time on. So cybersecurity plans or information security policies. Uh, I'm a big policy person. I know Kelly's a big policy person. Um, what, what does your policy say that you do in certain incidents? Do you have a policy? Do you practice that policy? Is there something where you're actually going back to and utilizing a... Uh, I think the sorry just asked a question. So he's asking about malware. Um, so your policy being put in place is your plan for if an incident happens. So in the case of a malware attack, so malware is just what it sounds like. It's malicious software. They just Again, I, IT people love shortening words where they well they would say infosec instead of information security. I, I, I don't know why, but that's just how they, how they do things. Uh, so in malware, what you find is it's running some sort of malicious software that's involved in interrupting your operating system, or it's trying to collect data from your operating system. Now, because of most businesses utilize Windows or some Microsoft-based operating system, and a lot of core processors are using uh, Linux and, you know, certain uh, IBM-based product sets. And you're like, well, why, why are the two different? Well, uh, from a development uh, side, um, developing software is a lot uh, more complicated inside, you know, for core processing. And they have to be able to do a lot of different functionalities and a lot of things are customized based on that institution or based on their regulatory standards or their business process. And so what you'll find is a lot of times Microsoft um, operating software systems are meant to be just your business processing. That's just how you act. That's how you get on. That's how you access data. That's what you boot up to. But when you do boot up and you're going into your server to actually access your business application, that could be running on a different software system. And so a lot of times in credit unions, um, malware is intended to disrupt the, the operating system or the, uh, the, the version of Windows that you're running on your local PC, whether that's a laptop or a desktop at your office. And these malicious software uh, programs either are intended to try to encrypt files or they're trying to copy files or they're just trying to um, disrupt your business operations. By And that could be a slew of different things where it starts actually counteracting the operating system, where it's trying to run certain command functions, or it's running certain um, custom scripts in the background that's causing the operating system to crash. And so what we see a lot of times more frequently now, where I would say prior to the year 2004, a lot of malware was just a computer virus that was meant to shut down the computer. It wasn't trying to do anything else. Since ransomware, and call it what it is, since cryptocurrency has become so popular, ransomware has become very popular. And all ransomware is, it's a type of malware, but ransomware is activating on what they call an, an encryption. So it's encrypting files, and in order to get access back to those files, you have to have the encryption key. And to get this key, you have to then pay the bad actor money to for them to get get it back. Uh, perfect case, and I'll, I'll try to keep this short. We had a, uh, a sheriff's office in Florida was attacked by uh, hit by a ransomware attack. Um, every printer at 1:30 in the morning started printing out ransomware demands. Every printer in the entire office it shut down everything, including. Um, their 911 system. However, it did not shut down the 911 phone lines. It only shut down the 911 dispatch system. 
So we got a call and we got brought in to help remediate. And um, this sheriff's office wasn't a customer. They weren't a client of ours. And we had to immediately go in and start triaging what was going on. And so one of the things that we quickly discovered was we had to treat every device as if it was infected. And we were frantically trying to figure out, okay, what's still online and what's not online? What, what devices are offline? And can we try to take and maybe sandbox? That's a term we utilize where we're trying to just basically segregate some of those devices off of the network to see what's infected and what's not infected. And it took us about 72 hours and about five of our resources, and we were able to get them back up and running again without paying the ransom. We got lucky. Um, we were able to run a sequence of their backups um, so that it didn't boot the ransomware whenever we were reloading their systems, and we were able to get around it. Um, most of the time, what happens in that situation is bad actor gets in, and they don't immediately act. Um, most ransomware attacks occur within the last six months. And the reason why it takes six months is because they get in and they're watching your environment. They're watching how you, how who, who logs in where. They're utilizing like what they call keylogger software, which is then copying the username and passwords of some of your admin accounts. They're creating admin accounts once they get certain passwords. And you don't see them because there's nothing malicious happening. It's it's a lot of nuanced things happening in the background. Not all of them correlate. Uh, correlated to each other, but they're all trying to gather and disseminate data with inside your environment. And then once the bad actors feel they have either they have a they've encrypted your backups or they've located your backups so they know that you can't easily recover, that's when they initiate the attack. And in this case, um, they had been there for almost three months and mm. inside the environment. Um, we, we were able to, um, locate where, how it happened through email. Uh, and we were even able to, to go back and pinpoint the date and time, uh, that they first got in and where the data was going and how they were communicating out. Um, now, again, most of the time when you have a ransomware attack, you don't get it back in 72 hours. Um, we, we got very lucky in how the backups were encrypted. Um, um, and we got some really good people that work for us and they were able to kind of come in and, and disseminate. And um, because of our working relationship too, we do a lot with Homeland Security and the FBI, especially their Cyber Terrorism Task Force, as well as the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and the the uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, what they call HSI, which is Homeland Security Investigations, which is in charge of investigating every single cyber incident that takes place uh, inside of a critical infrastructure organization, which critical infrastructure includes credit unions and banks. And so HSI, which is a part of Homeland Security Initiative, a part of DHS, Department of Homeland Security, would be the ones that would come in and investigate the crime once it started taking place, along with the FBI. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I'm actually going to pull up a copy of our policy. And let me know once you can see this. And folks, just a reminder between policy and procedures, um, there's two different components to that. Remember that your policy needs to guide your credit union. It needs to give parameters for your things. The details for how you do things, specifics, who's assigned to it, those types of things can be in your procedures. Sometimes examiners will get real, real nitty gritty with your policy if you make your policy too detailed and then you're going to get dinged for not following your policy. But I will say this, when it comes to the IT cybersecurity policy, that is a policy that probably needs to be a little more detailed than some of your other policies or um, things within your credit unions. Yeah. Now, again, uh, can you see the... Uh... Can you see Not the yet. screen? Nope. All right. Try it one more time here. 
There All right, how about now? There we go. Yep. Okay, good deal. All right. So unfortunately, it took me all the way down here to the bottom. So go up here. All right. So now uh, one of the nice things is after we're done with uh, this Zoom meeting, uh, Kelly will be sending out a copy of this to everybody as uh, part of our presentation today. So this, uh, if you don't have a policy in place now, uh, this can serve as a very good framework of what these policies look like. Uh, now, I would not take this policy and go, all right, rubber stamp it, find a replace. <laughs> We've got a policy now. Uh, because one of the things that um, a lot of, uh, I would say, gets a lot of people in trouble is because they have it written in their policy, but they're not currently doing it. Remember, whatever you have written in your policy is what you're doing as an organization. So when you're getting audited uh, by your by the NCUA, and they're saying, okay, well, what does your policy say for acceptable use policy? Oh, well, it says this. Okay, well, it says this, but I just saw that you're allowing, it says that you're not allowed to access any personal um, or social media sites from your work computer, but right over there, I see two employees uh, on Facebook. Oh, well, yeah, um, we need to address that. Because remember, whatever you say in policy, you have to practice in reality. And so kind of going through, and I, I won't bore you with all the details of individual policies, but um, your disaster recovery plans, uh, clean desk policy, uh, all the way down to um, pandemic response planning policy wasn't a big deal until COVID. And then all of a sudden, pandemic response planning became uh and work from home policy became the most important thing you did as an organization. Uh, so having these policies in place, some of these you will never use. Uh, some of these you hope you would never have to use. But remember in that break glass moment, whenever you do have an emergency and you have to go back to your policy, you have to have something in place. But policy should be your, your, your playbook. It should tell you what you should do in case of an emergency. Then you have individual procedures that go more granular in depth on that individual policy, if that makes sense. And with that, do we have any other questions? Again, feel free to throw it in the chat or... Um... Unmute yourself. I know it's a lot. Um, so I, I'll, I'll throw out one of these. This is one that I got asked the other day. Um, what kind of training exists for employees? And what kind of training systems or software or their services out there for training employees? And I'll tell you one of the ones that we have found that works very, very well, and it's relatively inexpensive for what it is, uh, is a service called Know Before, which is utilized by a lot of companies to do for email phishing attempts to try to spoof and train employees on how to recognize a malicious email or a bad actor that's trying to fish or spoof someone uh, involved in an email attack. But what Know Before also can do on the back end is they can customize training modules for your individual employees. Now, not every employee needs to be trained the exact same way on the same systems because they're not utilizing, you know, certain aspects of, you know, um, and I would say that a lot of, um, a lot of times, uh, there's great products out there. You just don't know they're, they're feature rich or they got a lot of things going on. Know Before is one of them. Uh, and, and that's one that we've, we've utilized as well as uh, some of the uh, free trainings. Make your password 
complex and you try to make them so that nobody else can recognize what your password is. Um, and that used, that was like, that's what we went by. So we had policies in place where we were forcing users every 30 days to change their passwords that had to be unique. They couldn't use the same password over and over again. Well, now uh, the mindset has flipped and now they're saying, no, you should use uh, passwords that you can remember but you should have what's called multi-factor authentication in place on the back end. There should be a secondary means to authenticate other than your password. Uh, your banking apps today that you log into, like I use for my credit union, um, whenever I log in, it prompts me with a password and then either face ID and a PIN. Um, because of that, you know, it's, it's become a little bit easier to kind of manage your passwords. A lot of people utilize different applications. LastPass, I think, is one um, that our organization uses a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of different password management systems, but what I would tell you as an organization, the easiest way to do it is to not to have your policy in place so that, yes, you require password changes um, during a certain time frame, but that you have multi-factor authentication in place. And there's a lot of different tools out there for multi-factor authentication, whether it's via mobile app, it could be token-based, or um, it could be a, a remote card reader or some sort of like a, and one of the more popular ones is called YubiKey, which is just a USB dongle that acts as a key that then accesses and says, if you don't have this key with this password on this device, then you can't get in. Um, I would recommend that whatever your policy you try to, because what's happening these days is a lot of these guidelines are changing every year but where it used to be, it would go five or six years without them changing uh, guidelines or best practice recommendations. Now it's changing every single year to keep up with the threats because the threat is ever evolving. So our response and our policies and our, um, operations should also be evolving as the threat evolves. Um, and I would tell you that any organization, a lot of times you can eliminate um, the whole somebody guessing your password just by having multi-factor authentication in place because there's a secondary form of identification that has to occur for them, for you to allow access into your system. Other questions? I did put Zach's information in the chat as well as mine. Um, if you need additional information, if you need help, um, again, uh, Zach and, and um, CUVM work very closely together. Um, Zach has worked with credit unions that have, have lost IT managers and you need somebody to come in and um, you know do an evaluation, see where you're at. You need help with your cybersecurity. Um, they're there to help you. Um, again, we, we've done our due diligence as, as a third party as well to ensure that we've got a, a great partnership uh, to help support you as credit unions. Any other questions? All right. Zach, anything else? Um, no, I would just, well, actually, I will. I'll, I'll leave it on this one. Okay. This can be a very, it, this can be very scary, but at the same time, you can do certain things where multi-factor authentication, good data backups, and in endpoint in detection response and systems in place that can greatly reduce that threat, but the threat will never just go away. The other thing that I would tell you is where in the past, when you're a, a small to mid-sized credit union, you may have one IT person. And they're doing everything. Uh, they're they're doing all either the break fix day to day. My printer's not printing work all the way to they are your cybersecurity um, specialist, and they're they're the acting chief information security officer for your organization. But what I will tell you is is that this has become too big. It's 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 too big for just one person or a team of people to handle. You need an entire trusted team around your organization to help you in these circumstances and to be on top of the ever evolving threat and the ever changing threat of these cybersecurity incidents taking place. Um, so I will tell you that, 
you know, it's not a, it's not a silver bullet. It's not a one size fits all solution set. It's unique. Every organization is different. How you manage, how you, what your business process, how your business flow works. Um, so everything is custom and catered to your organization. <laughs> And that's a better way to manage um, because you don't want to you don't want to lob everything in the same basket. You want to utilize best practices where you can. And the NCUA has a framework for how you should conduct business as a organization. It's just now that this has changed. New policies have come out. New policies are coming out even next what next month or something. Next month, yes. Um, so with these changes you have to stay on top of it as an organization to be able to keep up, to be able to meet the NCUA regulations. So a lot of this has now become not just uh, best practices, but compliance driven, where you actually need more help on the compliance side and helping making sure that your policies are up to date and policies are up to place and things like that are, are taking place so that you're not playing catch up, or I should say you're, you're trying, you're playing keep up instead of catch up. Uh, you want to be in a keep up position. You'll never be ahead of this. You'll always be behind it, but how far behind it is completely up to you. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks, Zach. We really appreciate all your help. Again, if you need to reach out to us, reach out to your analyst, myself or Zach. Um, we can get you support or anything that you may need. And with that, we'll give you an extra 10 minutes back to your day. So thank you everyone and have a great day.